Well, we've come just about up to the present. We've seen the early days of density functional theory, its theoretical foundations, its rigorous underpinnings, the development of functionals from the local density approximation to generalized gradient to meta-generalized gradient to hybrid functionals, and all that's left really is to try to make a connection to 2013. So let me uh, try to do that and also try to sort of compare and contrast DFT versus MO theory or wave function theory, I might call it. So what are the, kind of the key points to make? Remember that density functional theory optimizes an electron density. Wave function theory optimizes a wave function. So if you would like to determine a molecular property, if you've done a DFT calculation, you have to ask yourself, how does the property depend on the density? Because what you have in hand is a density. In MO theory, we need to know the quantum mechanical operator. We've got a wave function, and we'd operate on it with an operator. Wave function theory has slightly broader utility because there are more operators in some sense that operate on a wave function than there are necessarily generic property functionals of the density. And not so many, but a few. And so a good example is, what if you'd like to know the total energy of the interelectronic repulsion? So even if you have the exact density, we do not have the exact exchange correlation energy functional. And so given a density, we don't actually know what the interelectronic repulsion is. On the other hand, in wave function theory, it's entirely trivial to just evaluate 1 over r between all the electrons, and poof, out comes the interelectronic repulsion. So in general, it's, it's uh, two electron properties. So for instance, uh, zero field splitting in triplets is something that is less easy to get with density functional theory than with, uh, with wave function theory. But in any case, uh, wave, uh, density functional theory is quite useful for a broad array of properties nevertheless. So one might say there is a DFT wave function after all because by adopting the cone-sham approach, we create a determinant of cone-sham orbitals and we could treat that determinant as a wave function. How useful is it? That is, we make a Slater determinant out of the KS orbitals. And by the way, that's the exact wave function Although for a fictional system of non-interacting electrons having the same density as the real system. Well, many years of experience have shown us that one interesting feature of these cone-sham determinants is that they have very low levels of spin contamination generally, even in cases where Hartree-Fock behaves quite badly. So earlier in the course, we talked about the benzyl radical and how spin contamination made it quite difficult to get the rotational barrier, for instance, of the benzyl radical. And that was associated with spin contamination. Density functional theory has no problem at all with that system. And that's an interesting, uh, interesting observation. Now, it's worth pointing out that how do you evaluate spin contamination? Well, you apply the S squared operator. But this is S squared, after all, applied to the cone-sham determinant we don't really know the relationship of that determinant to the real wave function for the density that comes from that determinant, right? The real wave function is interacting electrons and what those orbitals might look like, not clear. Nevertheless, it's been provocative at least that S squared tends not to show spin contamination in uh, DFT determinants and that may imply that you will do better with open shell systems. And in fact, I'll, I'll just say that uh, much experience suggests DFT is indeed more robust in open shell systems. So in wave function theory methods, we generate excited states. We can do it by taking linear combinations of determinants that are formed by exciting electrons out of occupied orbitals in the Hartree-Fock determinant into virtual orbitals. So remember, that's what configuration interaction is. Density functional theory doesn't really have that capability because it doesn't make a wave function. There is this cone-sham determinant, but who knows what that is. Instead, uh, one invokes a time-dependent formalism to get at the changes associated with going to excited states. That you treat the excited state as a response to a perturbation. And we will uh, take a greater look at that when we get to excited states later in the course.
Now, what about computational efficiency? So local DFT models, and I, I mentioned earlier a distinction between local and non-local. So hybrid methods, because they include Hartree-Fock exchange, are non-local methods. So if you hear someone make a distinction between local and non-local, that is equivalent to uh, specifying a functional that does not have Hartree-Fock exchange and one that does. Occasionally you'll hear people call uh, local density functionals pure functionals. Uh, that's, that's sort of a colloquial expression. It probably should not be used, but uh, a better one in any case is local and non-local. But if you are local and you're not paying the end of the fourth cost for uh, Hartree-Fock exchange, then your scaling is at worst n cubed, and in fact you can uh, often do better. So uh, this bullet here was written some time ago. It may not necessarily be true, and it probably depends on program. But in any case, at the time, on a 15-atom uh, system, the cost of a density functional calculation with a decent basis set was about twice that of a Hartree-Fock calculation. And why is it uh, more expensive? Well, it's the scaling that's better. But the actual calculation itself has some overhead associated with it. DFT requires numerical solution of a number of integrals. That integration is slow relative to fully analytic Hartree-Fock. And so at least at this 50, for this 15-atom molecule, the cost of doing the DFT was twice as much. But if I were to double the size of the basis set, I would expect the Hartree-Fock cost to go up by 2 to the 4th power, because it scales as n to the 4th, whereas I'd expect DFT to only go up by... 2 to the third power, or 8, and so at that stage I would see equal performance. I'd have captured that factor of 2, and the bigger the molecule gets and the bigger the basis set, DFT starts to win very quickly. You can see some improvement in certain things when you use basis functions that are not contracted Gaussian functions, and uh, you can use Slater type functions, for instance. Now in Hartree-Fock theory, we didn't do that because we couldn't solve those integrals analytically, but in DFT, you can't solve all your integrals analytically anyway. So as long as you're going to be doing quadrature and numerical integration, uh, you aren't really restricted to Gaussian basis sets unless you feel you want to use them. Uh, it's still convenient for the nuclear attraction and for the kinetic energy, but it doesn't have to be. So there are, there are codes that do in fact use Slater type functions. One is the Amsterdam density functional code, and they can be very speedy as long as you optimize your numerical routines. In periodic systems, so solids for instance, uh, the local character of some density functionals is a very nice property. You can use plane waves as basis sets. A uh, large number of plane waves might be needed if you have aperiodic densities in, uh, in the unit cells, but the integrals are simple to solve and use Fourier transform approaches to speed this up. So there's a lot of use of density functional theory in dynamics and in solid state physics. The convergence with respect to basis set. So empirically it's observed that DFT results are less sensitive to basis set incompleteness than wave function theory methods, and particularly highly correlated, that is post hartree fock wave function theory methods. And so, in general, by the time you're up to, say, a polarized triple zeta basis set in density functional theory, you're going to be getting pretty well converged results. If you go to quadruple zeta, you will not see a big difference. For wave function theory, that is less true, and so that's a nice feature of DFT, this convergence. Uh, various approaches have been undertaken to make DFT scale linearly, not as n cubed, but actually just as n. Some of those approaches are sometimes called divide and conquer, and it consists of separating a big system up into a series of small subsystems that interact. And you can do that because of the local character of DFT. You can do it particularly effectively. And uh, by doing that, eventually you'll get large enough that it's just the subsystems that dictate your scaling. Uh, and so this is just your, uh, my emphasis that most of what I've outlined above is optimal with local DFT functionals. It's not an absolute restriction. You can still do many of these things up here. You just can't do them quite as efficiently. So what are the limitations of the Cone-Sham formalism? And I want to make this point because we, we early on in this series of lectures went from sort of formal DFT, which has nothing to do with setting up operators and uh, evaluating uh, orbital-based things, 
Instead, formal DFT really just talks about densities and optimizing densities. But because we didn't have a way to get at, say, the kinetic energy, we played this trick with the cone-sham approach. But that imposes limitations on uh, the things we can study. So what are the cone-sham limitations? Well, we can compute the kinetic energy, that's why it's good, uh, but we have to have a Slater determinant. And so there are systems that are not well described by a single Slater determinant. We've seen uh, these in the context of discussing MCSCF theory, so cases where multiple determinants are needed to account for non-dynamical electron correlation. And so trimethylene methane, for example, was an, uh, something that we looked at in class where the singlet state required multiple Slater determinants. Open shell singlets in general are situations where you typically need at least two Slater determinants. And so that's, a, that's more of a challenge for uh, cone sham theory because you want to somehow in introduce the non-dynamical correlation but not to double count it. And it's by no means obvious in a given exchange correlation functional how to separate non-dynamical components from dynamical components. What about systematic improvability? So in wave function theory, we have a very well-defined path to get to the exact solution. And remember what the exact solution is. It's full configuration interaction with an infinite basis set. So uh, we often can't afford to do that. So having that well-defined path, it's like trying to climb Mount Everest. You might be able to see your way to the top, but that doesn't make it easy. Nevertheless, it's, it's there, and you know it can be done, and maybe you'll let somebody else do it. But in DFT, how do you go about doing a better calculation? All current functionals are approximate. Something has been done to put in some sort of best guess at what the exact exchange correlation functional should look like. And there's really not any obvious way to determine which functional is optimal for a given case. Now, certainly you can explore your convergence with respect to basis set, and you should. You'd like to you know, ensure that your mathematical approaches are converged. But the theory convergence, that's trickier. So, of course, often what you'll do, much like with semi-empirical theory, would be compare different functionals. If you see they all give similar results, you'll certainly probably feel more confident about that result. And if they give quite different results, you will need to puzzle over which ones may or may not be most appropriate. Uh, one way to judge that might be to compare with a highly correlated wave function theory treatment, if you can afford to do that. Or you may have some experimental data you can compare against. So this all comes back to how do you do the right calculation, and there is a certain uh, degree of smell test and benchmarking and uh, logical analysis that goes into deciding in DFT what's, what's accurate. All that said, experience shows that DFT is robust over a wide variety of systems. So when I say DFT is semi-empirical, it's a little bit unfair from the standpoint of most people associate semi-empirical with things like NDDO theory, neglect of diatomic differential overlap. So those theories can have very, very large errors uh, in many, many instances, and they're sort of non-systematic, and uh, they're very fast, but you pay a price because it's semi-empirical. DFT, on the other hand, has very few parameters generally, and tends to experience relatively small errors over very, very large ranges. So really, we should restrict semi-empirical to not be used pejoratively, but instead to reflect that there is not this beautiful systematic approach to full CI with an infinite basis. Mind you, development continues in DFT functionals, and it may uh, happen that people get closer and closer to exact solutions. So let me talk about some of the deficiencies that are known for primarily the older popular functionals. Many of these are being addressed as we speak. So prior to 2005, uh, it was hard to find a given functional that was good for barrier heights and, say, transition metal bond energies all at the same time. And indeed, people had noticed that those functionals that worked best for organic chemistry, first and second row atoms, if you will, were not necessarily very effective once you introduced transition metals. Certainly prior to 2005 or so, most functionals were extraordinarily bad for non-covalent interactions. So that is, and, and by this I... I predominantly mean attractive interactions. So pi-pi stacking, for instance, a well-known attractive interaction between uh, pi faces 
and uh, many older generation functionals are disastrous for this. Charge transfer excitation. So we haven't talked yet about electronic excited states, but we will get there, and I'll focus on this then. And then finally, there's an expense aspect if you do include Hartree-Fock exchange, so just something to think about. So this, uh, again, a slide I borrowed from Don Trular. This is just to illustrate this non-bonded interaction problem. So here is a tyrosine residue. So here you see a phenol, which is the side chain in tyrosine, interacting with phenylalanine, so just a benzene in the phenylalanine case. And the best estimate for the uh, binding energy in this system is 5.3 kcals per mole from a pi-pi stacking interaction. So what do we actually find with, and my convention here, by the way, is that a positive number implies a favorable binding energy. A negative number actually implies a repulsion between the two. And so we take this geometry, which is uh, optimized with a wave function theory model that's very high level and should be very accurate. And we find that these older generation functionals like BLYP and B3LYP, they actually predict the interaction to be repulsive. So they would drive these two molecules apart instead of recognizing the favorable attraction. Some other older generation functionals are shown here. Purdue Burke Ernserhoff, Becky 98, a hybrid version of Purdue Burke Ernserhoff, TPSS, BMK, and so on. And then here are Minnesota functionals. So you recognize a small amount of partisanship in this slide. So this is Don Trulier's slide. But these are functionals from, uh, from Minnesota that are local. L means local, so no Hartree Fock exchange. If you don't specify it at all with MO6, I believe it's 28% if memory serves Hartree Fock exchange. MO 6.2x here, that's twice as much Hartree-Fock exchange, so if this is 28, this is 56, and I could have those numbers wrong in memory, but in any case, this is double what it is in MO6. And you see they're all doing very well. They're quite close to the 5.3, uh, and MO5 is an earlier generation before MO6. MO6HF is actually 100% Hartree-Fock exchange, so no density functional exchange in there. Uh, subsequently, many others have recognized this deficiency, and as opposed necessarily to developing functionals that just intrinsically do well, they've put on what I might call a molecular mechanics-like add-on term, a post-hoc dispersion term, uh, which just looks at atoms and perhaps polarizabilities of atoms and computes interactions that way. And that's usually designated by adding dash D or dash D second generation or third generation Many formalisms were uh, developed by the group of Stefan Grimme in Germany, and uh, he's the one who gave them these names. And people then apply them to some of the older generation functionals to improve this, this specific interaction. So you still get some of the good performance observed intramolecularly with these functionals, and now you've added an intermolecular correction, effectively, that it restores some of their performance. But in any case, we might ask, how do things do across a, a still broader barrier? So up till now, we've talked about bond strengths. We've talked about barriers. I've just mentioned non-covalent interactions. This is a database containing transition metal uh, bond energies between transition metals and uh, ligands of some sort, or reaction energies involving uh, transition metals. And these are three different functionals. So the old Becky 3LYP the uh, hybrid GGA, so this is a hybrid functional just as this one is, B97-3, and finally this uh, from the Minnesota group, from Don Trular's group, MO6. This is the amount of Hartree-Fock exchange, oh, so I see it's 27, I think I said 28 on the last slide, but 27% Hartree-Fock exchange, and so too for B97-3. And if we just look at the performances here, you see that the MO6 functional, which is a quite recent one, is doing extremely well. So we've got uh, a number we've seen before, 0.6 kcal per mole error on bonds, barrier heights down to 2 kcal per mole average errors, non-covalent interactions within chemical accuracy of a kcal per mole, and transition metals, which really are some of the most challenging things, down to 6. And in fact, if we uh, go to a local functional, so these were all hybrid functionals. Now, if you eliminate Hartree-Fock exchange, so here's a big molecule, C104H30N4. And I've forgotten exactly what this calculation is on, but it's a big molecule. Uh, with local density functional theory, it takes 17 hours to do the calculation. Add in Hartree-Fock exchange, that cost goes up substantially, more than a factor of 10. 
So these are some local functionals, 0% heart refoc exchange, and let's see how they're doing on bonds, barriers, non-covalent interactions, and transition metal uh, strengths. And you see that uh, there is, in these slightly older generation ones, there is some degradation in quality, uh, but MO6L, which has been tuned specifically for its locality, continues to do really quite well, and uh, in particular, it does well on transition metals. And I'll add that while these numbers don't show it, in general, we find that the use of local functionals when there is a transition metal involved improves on hybrid functionals. So here it looks like the same number, but it, at least in, in my experience, uh, generally metals, local functionals, best approach. So let's come right up to the present today. I could go on and on and on talking about the, com the comparative performance of different functionals and you would get very tired of this video. So just as an illustration, yesterday I typed into Google's search engine DFT functional benchmark. You'll note there are 18,600 results that were returned. Here's a series of them. Here's one from the Trular group. There are many others. Here's one from the Grima group I mentioned. Uh, dispersion corrections for intermolecular interactions and large benchmark set. Highly accurate first principles benchmark data sets. So there is a cottage industry in benchmarking DFT functionals. So in general, if you want to do a DFT calculation in a given system and you're unsure about what functional should work and you haven't got a lot of experience, uh, it's sort of incumbent on you to go to the literature and take a quick tour because probably somebody has done some benchmark calculations on things similar to what you're interested in and you'll get some good advice from looking at those. So we've finished up with density functional theory. I hope you have a better appreciation for its underpinnings and how it compares to wave function based theories. And as we move on in the course, we'll start to focus on employing DFT for the computation of various properties.